and we are on the air or something. Woohoo! Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to Liberty.me Live. I'm Lucy Stegerwald, um, and I'm here with the excellent and well bearded Sheldon Richmond. And uh, we're going to talk about Iran and things like that. Um, yes. So, I guess. We're a little unsure here. Um, so the lack of an audience is making it a little awkward, but we're going to do this. We're going to learn stuff. It's going to be good. Um, I'm not as caffeinated as I should be. Uh, Sheldon, do you want to kind of tell us, paraphrase, uh, summarize, what have you, sure. what's been happening with Iran lately? Yeah, I'll try to do that. That could take, of course, uh, many nights, but I'll try to pack it into a few minutes. The, the big news is, by the way, the big deadline right. that everybody, all the news well, you know, the news uh, channels have been looking forward to, namely Midnight Tonight, uh, I guess, Lausanne, Switzerland time. That deadline has now been uh, extended. So, great anticlimax. We've all been waiting. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And I kept saying, this is not, this is a self-imposed deadline. It wasn't imposed by God or anything. They, why can't they extend it? Sure enough, they extended it. So, at least 24 hours. And, uh, and actually, the, the really final deadline is not until the end of June when they're supposed to have the fully fleshed out agreement regarding uh, Iran's nuclear uh, industry or nuclear program. So let me say a little bit about that and then try to relate it to everything else that's going on in the Middle East, including including Yemen, which is now the latest, even though Yemen has been simmering for a long time. The U.S. has been going to the drones and whatnot. Uh, that, that has now obviously uh, come to a boil. So I'll try to say a little bit about that. That's really complicated. I do not claim to be an expert on Yemen. I don't know if anybody's an expert on Yemen. But at least I can give you a sense of how complicated mm -hmm. it is. But to talk about the nuclear stuff first, uh, what I'm about to say is something. If you if you only rely on the mainstream media, you're going to think I'm nuts because you haven't heard this before. And that and that's that's a definition of a nut, right? Somebody who says something do you never heard before. Uh, which means why, that's why libertarians are often considered nuts because they haven't heard people haven't heard it before. But uh, okay, so there's a there's what they call the P5 plus one P5 plus one P5 plus one uh, uh, versus Iran negotiations. I guess you should, I shouldn't say versus. Uh, and the P5 plus one means the five permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, you probably know who they are, or you can Google it. Uh, plus Germany, which of course is not a permanent member of the Security Council, since it was on the losing side of that war back uh, some years ago. <clears throat> so uh, they've been talking for uh, what since last year, sometime 18 months maybe, uh, about uh, Iran's nuclear program. And the, of course, the object is to come up with an agreement that will assure everybody that Iran uh, uh, is not building a nuclear weapon, would be very uh, Far away from one, if it decided to build one, and and, and because there'd be uh, uh, there'd be controls over enrichment of uranium and whether it can stockpile uranium with, at different levels of enrichment, so on and so forth. Uh, but there's one thing you need to know, uh, which is only once in a while uh, told to the American people by the mainstream media, namely that the Iran does not have a nuclear weapons program, has never had a nuclear weapons program. Has uh, the, the supreme leader has issued a fatwa against uh, nuclear weapons as being uh, a sinful against Islam. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, the original supreme leader uh, after uh, the Islamic Revolution of '79, uh, declared he didn't want nuclear weapons because he identified nuclear weapons with the two powers he most despised, namely the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, and so. They've not done anything to acquire nuclear weapons, even when they had a chance to. Now, they have a nuclear power program and also a medical, a nuclear medical program to, to create isotopes, medical isotopes, which are used in the treatment of cancer and, I guess, other things. Uh, however, this program began under the Shah of Iran before 1979 with U.S. help, because the Shah, of course, was a close ally of the United States and Israel. The Shah was a brutal... Uh, uh, monarch, autocrat, uh, whom the CIA restored to power in 1953 when he was eclipsed by a democratically elected uh, parliament and uh, prime minister, prime minister by the name of Mosaddegh, who was a sort of slightly left of center uh, uh, ruler or uh, office holder who uh, talked about nationalizing uh, British oil interests in Iran. 
And that was more than uh, the West could stand. So uh, we sent the uh, CIA in with bags of cash to uh, stage a lot of demonstrations, which eventually created pressure so that Mossadegh left power. And this put restored the uh, the Shah. Uh, they had some complicated uh, uh, constitutional system, but this let the Shah retake the power he had before uh, the election of the uh, prime minister. And then he proceeded for the next 26 years to rule with an iron hand. He had a secret police called the Savak. He was very close to Israel. And the U.S. helped them build, helped him build a nuclear, a civilian nuclear program. Now, the reason I stress that is for two reasons. Number one, the, the Ayatollahs did not begin, start it. The, the, the plants, the initial equipment and whatnot, the infrastructure uh, was already that were there. And number two, when you hear people today, the war party say, what does Iran need a nuclear power program for? It's got oil. Keep in mind that the U.S. must have thought or agreed with the Shah that it needed one. Oil runs out someday, and medical isotopes have nothing to do with oil. And so uh, American mm -hmm. uh, uh, foreign policy uh, uh, types uh, thought it was okay when the Shah wanted nuclear power, so isn't it a little odd to, to try to... Uh, use that to ex expose alleged deception on the part of uh, the current regime in Iran by saying, well, of course, they don't need nuclear power. They're, they're an oil power. So anyway, the book on this, which I recommend to anyone who's really curious about this stuff, and it's a well done book uh, uh, with a lot of documentation, is Gareth Porter's uh, manu Manufactured Crisis. And it, it, he goes painstakingly through the entire history of of Iran's nuclear power beginning with the Shah to show that uh, the Islamic uh, revolution in 79 uh, has not been attempting uh, to um, obtain a nuclear weapon or build a nuclear weapon, even though they had lots of opportunities. They bought equipment from the famous A.Q. Khan, the Pakistani who was exposed some years ago as uh, trafficking in nuclear technology and even equipment. And they bought some uh, information from him. They bought some, you know, directions, technical directions. But they never tried to buy weapons uh, type of equipment or uh, instructions. So uh, there's lots of evidence that they have no interest in a nuclear weapon. By the way, uh, two, on two different occasions, the uh, 16 uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence agencies, yes, we have 16 of them. Uh, that's good enough for government work, I guess. 16 different intelligence agencies have signed off on a national intelligence estimate in 2007 and 2011 saying that uh, Iran is not uh, building a nuclear weapon. Uh, and the Mossad, the uh, Israeli uh, CIA, uh, has said the same thing and it has even advised Netanyahu that Iran never took a, uh, any step or decision to acquire a nuclear weapon. So what is this all about? Well, you know, there have been sanctions from the U.S., led by the U.S., and uh, and then Europe and others have gone along under huge U.S. pressure over the years on Iran over this uh, nuclear, uh, uh, alleged nuclear program. Uh, Iran is very interested in getting these sanctions lifted. It's, uh, while some people in Iran are making a lot of money off this, like the Revolutionary Guard because of the black market, it is hurting regular uh, Iranian people. Uh, as we would expect, so we're actually uh, waging economic war against the Iranians, or the Iranian people, uh, maybe not so much the government, but the people, and those are the ones that usually get hurt by economic warfare. Uh, you should also know that Iran has long been a signatory of the, of the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and it is a declared non-weapon state, and by doing that, they are subject, Iran is subject to uh, surprise uh, inspections of its nuclear facilities and the, the International Atomic Agency, uh, Atomic Energy Agency uh, accounts for every speck, every atom of uranium that Iran, that Iran possesses and it has done that uh, regularly and has certified, uh, you know, every time that no uranium has been diverted to, to the creation of nuclear Weapons. So Iran seems to uh, be uh, true to its word and not creating nuclear weapons. Now it has once in a while been caught in some secrecy and uh, by having things that were not declared, maybe an underground plant that wasn't declared, although there's, there's a lot of uh, controversy about whether that's even true. But, but as Porter points out in his book, the U.S. ever since 1979 has, has held uh, Iran to be the, the villain, right? The, the villain behind all evil in the world because 
Uh, we didn't like the revolution. When I say we, I mean the U.S. government. It opposed the revolution. It, it stood by the Shah. Carter, Jimmy Carter stood by the Shah until the bitter end. Uh, the uh, anger at the United States boiled over right after the revolution, and the uh, the liberals were sort of eclipsed by the uh, the, the theocrats. And as you as you may well know from uh, reading history, or maybe you were alive at the time, uh, 52 hostages were taken in the U.S. embassy and held there for I think 444 days and weren't freed until Carter was out of power and, uh, and Ronald Reagan was being um, inaugurated. Uh, so there's been uh, there's been um, uh, you know sore feelings toward uh, Iran ever since, and the U.S., uh, every U.S. administration has vowed to thwart Iran in its attempt to build its, to complete the nuclear power program that began under the Shah. And the U.S., uh, in that, in that, to that end, put pressure on every country to not deal with Iran on anything that has to do with any, you know, with nuclear power. That means uh, sending scientists, sending advisors, helping them build the plants. And so, yes, Iran has engaged in some secrecy, in order to obtain some things, because the U.S. has this world has had this worldwide campaign to keep every bit of it out of its hands, and this is part of a more general problem that that you need to know to understand the situation. The, the U.S. government, and no matter whether it's a Republican or a Democrat in, in power, uh, will not concede that Iran, number one, is a, is a sovereign country, is always going to be a big influential player in the Middle East, given its size, given its history. Uh, and so has attempted to humiliate it and, uh, you know, and basically emasculate it and treat it like some, you know, two-bit little uh, uh, territory that uh, that doesn't deserve any sort of consideration. And obviously the Iranian people don't like that kind of treatment, especially from a power of the U.S. that's not even a Middle Eastern power. So you got to keep all this in perspective. Uh, should I stop there and for uh, more of a conversation um we, we can because i could keep well, i have questions the whole time. <laughs> um also i'll pretend to be suave and not that i am under caffeinated and completely failed to introduce you and i'll say for those of you just joining us we're talking to sheldon richmond about iran and sheldon he, uh, he blogs at Free Association, that's his blog name. Um, he is with the Center for State... Is that yes? <laughs> He's affiliated with the Center for Stateless Society. Um, he's the chair of the trustees and a senior fellow. Um, he, his work has been in uh, the Freeman, Future of Freedom. Uh, he's regularly at Reason.com. And he's written a bunch of books that uh, are all... They're good. He does good stuff, everybody. So you probably already know that, but if you don't, you know some more. Um, and back to Iran, I guess my first, and you guys can ask questions um, a little later if you want, just post them wherever. Um, I guess one of my questions is always, it seems like people like us uh, have been fearing an actual war with Iran um, for years and years, almost for as long as I've been paying attention. And... I don't know how you feel about that, whether it's likely to happen, because there's always this sort of ongoing fear that finally certain hawks um, will get down to that. Yep. And, you know, we have a new crop of horrible people like cotton. Um, I don't know. What do, you, what do you see happening there? Well, it's always perilous to try to predict the future, but there's, it's certainly something to be concerned about. You have the war party here who uh, that has, I think, always wanted regime change in Iran, even if that means war. Uh, and to go back a little bit, let's let's keep in mind what happened under George W. Bush, not to go back too far. Let's just, just go back to George W. Bush. In 2003, the Bush administration invades Iraq. Now, Iraq, Iraq uh, was a uh, secular regime, had a secular regime run by a Sunni, but not a religious Sunni. Saddam Hussein was not you know, one of these religious guys. He was a secularist. The Ba'athist party is, is secular, just like the Ba'athist party in Syria. Uh, although Assad is more like a Shiite. He's from an offshoot faction of uh, sect of the Shiites. Anyway, the U.S. invades and knocks off Saddam Hussein. But Saddam Hussein, while a secularist, ruled over and... Uh, kind of held back or discriminated against the Shiite majority in Iraq. So major, uh, Iraq was a, is a Shiite majority country. 
It's about 60% or more uh, Shiite. Iran is Shiites. Now, Iran, of course, is made up of Persians, not Arabs. You've got to keep all this straight, right? Uh, Ir Iraqis are Arabs. Most of the Middle East is, is Arab, but the Iranians are not Arab. And they're Shiites. Uh, much of the, uh, Arab, the Arab world is, um, is Sunni, although there are Shiite uh, Arabs. Uh, when the U.S. knocked off Saddam Hussein and knocked that government out, it was inevitable. Everybody must have known, if you know anything about Iraq and Iran, that Iraq was going to become an ally of Iran, that the regime was going to be, even if it was friendly to the U.S. at first, was still going to be an, a Shiite regime, which it was. And so Iraq and Iran are close allies. So the, in other words, the, the neocons who wanted the war, and this also includes the Israeli leadership and the Israeli lobby, uh, everybody that wanted that war, the Saudis too, uh, helped to make Iraq an ally of Iran. So keep that in mind today when you hear on the news everybody running around with their hair on fire about this new influence of Iran throughout the Middle East. And we'll say it controls so many uh, capitals now, Baghdad, uh, 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 Damascus, uh, and now it's going to control uh, the Yemen, the Sana'a, the, uh, the, uh, the capital of Yemen. Keep in mind that the US, that's the U.S. doing. So now that leads to the question, why did, they, why did Bush go into Iraq? When they had every reason to know Iraq would become an ally of Iran, and Iran is the bet noir, right? Uh, is the big boogeyman. Why, why would they help Iran that way? The only answer I can come up with, and these aren't stupid people, and they're not that ignorant of history and, and other cultures. I'm sure, I'm sure they do some reading, or have, they have some uh, people who concentrate on these things. The only thing I can figure is their next step was to go after Iran itself. Maybe, maybe Syria first. But then, then affect a regime change in Iran. It's the only thing that makes the Iraq invasion, uh, makes any sense of the Iraq invasion from their point of view. But Bush got cold feet and was afraid to attack Iran. He, I guess he figured it was just going to be some big impossible war after all, and he, and he wouldn't go along with it. And I don't think Obama wants a war with Iran either. It would be horrendous. So, uh, Iran is much larger, both in terms of population and area. Uh, uh, than Iraq. Uh, it's got a well-educated middle class. It's got weapons. Uh, it's, that would not be an easy thing. And look how bad Iraq went. And Iraq, Iran is in the position mm -hmm. to hurt, quote, American interests. Like, for one thing, to kill Americans in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And uh, because there are Americans in Iraq, of course, a few thousand Americans in Iraq, at least. Uh, and so that, that would be horrendous. Now, what about Israel? Israel has been threatening war against Iraq for years. Netanyahu constantly threatens Iraq, Iran with war. That's another reason why Iran has hidden uh, n nuclear uh, power uh, facilities and put them deep underground. Iran, uh, Israel has been talking about attacking Iran for years. Now, there's good reason to think it's a bluff. Mm -hmm. They're really hoping the U.S. would do it because Israel doesn't really have the power for a sustained air attack on, on, uh, on Iran. They would need American help. I don't think Obama wants a war. I don't think Obama wants to spend the last two years of his administration, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, remember, mired in Iran after he gets into power by promising to end the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I think the odds are against a war, but look at the other side. Uh, John McCain just the other day out loud was thinking in front of him, speaking to a group, out loud said he hoped maybe it's time for Israel to be the rogue nation and attack Iran. He said that out loud. You can find it online. Uh, I put it up on Facebook. There's a video of it. Again. <sighs> Meanwhile, neocons are more and more openly talking about war. In the Washington Post last week, Joshua Moravchek, one of the leading uh, neocon intellectuals, who was all in favor of the war in Iraq, says the, we need, we'll, it looks like we'll need to have a war against Iran. And just uh, right after that, uh, late last week or over the weekend, John Bolton, Bush's ambassador to the UN, another leading, uh, another leader of the uh, brain trust of the neocons, said the only way to stop the Iranian bomb is to bomb Iran. They're openly talking about it now. So it's not impossible. The, I think the best thing we have going for us is that Obama, I don't really think Obama wants a war. And we need to keep our fingers crossed because, um, you know, who knows? Look, Obama's going to be out of office in uh, 2017, and and some Republican could get in there uh, who will have less uh, hesitant 
about uh, bombing Iran than uh, than Obama. Yeah, I mean, I, I always wonder if they really want to commit to a war or if they just want sanctions and they want, you know, Iran to do what they say. But it's true that some of them truly do give out the impression that they're itching for a war. And I don't know. It's, I wonder if they know what they look like sometimes. They, know, they must know. You're supposed to be more subtle about it. Sanctions aren't going to get them where they want to go. First of all, there have been very harsh sanctions up till now. And it did not do that. Now, by the way, don't fall for the old line that they used that the sanctions got to the table, to this negotiating table. That's a throwaway line by the neocons. That's not even by the, the Obama administration. That is not true. Ten years ago or more, Iran was making offers to sit down and, all, and air all this and negotiate it all and come to some uh, agreement so that the world would be assured that they're not building a nuke and uh, they could get the sanctions. Uh, the sanctions that did exist uh, lifted. Um, the, the Bush administration uh, uh, rebuffed them. When Europe seemed interested in something with them, the, U the U.S. stood in the way and vetoed it, basically. And more and more sanctions were, were put on. Uh, and, um, and meanwhile, of course, Iran was building up its, uh, its nuclear industry. It was acquiring uh, centrifuges. They went from hundreds to thousands during the time of these sanctions. So. In a way, Moravchik and Bolton are right. War, they, they can't get it the, uh, through sanctions. You know, Netanyahu came to Washington a couple weeks ago and said, we don't need to take this bad deal because we can get a better deal. Put real tough sanctions on and we'll get a better deal. His own allies here, like Bolton and Moravchik, say, no, he's wrong. More sanctions won't get us where we want to go. Therefore, they say, we need war. So, you know, they're playing the tough cop to Netanyahu's Hard to believe that Netanyahu is the good cop right, in this in this case, but only relative to speak. Um, now I know you said you mentioned going back all the way to George Bush, and that sort of reminded me of what to me always seems like the disturbingly short memory, purposeful on some people's cases, not so purposeful on the poor masses who maybe aren't paying attention. Not to sound like a horrible snob. Um, but when I think back about the coup, I just think that, I mean, Americans have the capacity to remember the storming of the embassy, right? They're still horrified by that, and that's why, I mean, they, they, they like an embassy is American soil, and they actually have the audacity to do that, and they, they don't remember any farther back than that. Do you, I mean, I, I, this, this is just the same old blowback question, I guess, but, um, I don't know, did, like, what kind of understanding could it possibly take? Uh, what do people need to know to realize that, that maybe the average person not to be so afraid of, of Iran? Um, well, that's if, if that makes yeah, sense. It's hard to get their attention, and it's hard to uh, you know, teach them history. I mean, Americans always think history day began on the day something bad happened to an American, and we were just minding our own. <laughs> that's so quotable. Sorry. 9-11. <laughs> like you say, the 1979 with the hostage, uh, hostages, uh, and you can think of plenty of your own examples. Uh, we were minding our own business, and somebody totally unprovoked, out of the blue, comes and does something. Now, I'm not justifying taking hostages. I'm, not, I'm certainly not justifying 9-11. Uh, so I hope no one in this uh, virtual room would misunderstand me, because uh, that's, a, that's a charge that's often made, right? It was made against Ron Paul. That you're saying, oh, we deserved it, or we invited it, or we, uh, we, you know, we wanted it to happen, or something mm -hmm. like that. That's not the point. The, it, it, we're talking about a sort of a causal chain. You know, you, in any trial, the prosecution attempts to show motive for the crime. That's not an attempt to excuse the criminal. I mean, the prosecution's not in the business of excusing criminals, but he wants the jury to understand uh, why the person did what he did. So it can be a heinous act that's totally unjustified. And, and criminal and evil and all that stuff. But that doesn't mean it's not helpful to understand why the person did it. And if there's good reason to think the person did it because of, of uh, bad things the U.S. government has been doing, even if that act of, of so-called retaliation wasn't justified, that still tells us something. I mean, the, the neocons, the war party seems to take the view that, no, if they did something bad, it doesn't matter what we did. So we can keep doing it. They're just wrong to do what they did. Well, that's ridiculous. First of all, 
we might want to present prevent it in the future the same kind of thing i mean you know, should we not be interested in how we might um, you know prevent such things in the future but of course when I, if preventing things in the future means stopping being imperialist no the neocons don't want to hear about that they're willing to they're willing to have not themselves as a threat, but other Americans threatened so that they can keep on with their favorite foreign policy, which is basically micromanaging the Middle East and protecting Israel no matter what it does, no matter who it trashes, no matter uh, you know what, what, whose, whose land it occupies or who, what countries it invades. They don't want any of that questioned at all. So you can see why they say the sort of things they do, which is just to take people's minds off what may be uh, the root causes of violence directed at Americans. Hope I answered your question. I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my fault. Though. Um. Yeah. Um. Uh, I had something brewing about Tom Cotton in my brain, and it seems to have uh, evaporated slightly. I do live in the land of Cotton, uh, Tom Cotton. So, uh, that's not that's not good. <laughs> uh, I know I was being asked earlier about what I thought of the 2016 campaign, and I and I, I wanted to say I didn't get a chance, but I wanted to say that I'm looking ahead to the the 2020 campaign because that's when Tom Cotton's going to run for president. They just passed a uh, law here oh. in the legislature that was sponsored by a friend of his on his behalf to let Tom Cotton run run for re-election to the Senate and president at the same time. He can be listed on the ballot for both offices and. In Arkansas, that would have been impossible up until this law change just the other day. So, the the uh, ground is is being paved. God help us all. Um, when I saw a photo of Cotton in a military uniform with a kitten, and I saw libertarian leaning conservatives on my Twitter cooing over it, I kind of felt we were doomed. And then I realized he went to Harvard, yes. so he's an intellectual, okay. as it were. Uh -huh. Um, he actually went to the wars that he supports, and there's a part of him holding a damn kitten. Like, I feel like we might as well have his inauguration party now in my most pessimistic moments. In Arkansas, we're told that he's a farmer <sighs> from Dardanelle. They, don't, they somehow leave out that he went to law school at Harvard. Doesn't quite fit the picture, I guess. Mm, maybe, that's, maybe that's too much. Yeah, that's a little too, too. Oh, dear. Um... I was going to ask you a little bit about um, your feelings about Iran. I mean, like, even, you know, I, I, I'm desperate for people to try to understand that they're humans over there and they have similar motivations much of the time and they're not devils and all, but, I mean, does, does Iran or do other countries, um, sort of the classic neocon enemies, do they concern you at all? I mean, the idea of Iran getting a nuclear weapon or anything like that? I mean, is there a way to, like, sort of soothe the people and then also try to bring them over to the side of our side? Uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought, the, brought that up. Uh, you know, I'm no fan of the Iranian regime, okay? It's a theocracy. And I guess anybody who knows anything about me knows I probably wouldn't want to live in a theocracy. <laughs> uh, so I don't practice any religion myself, so I certainly don't want to live in in any, under any religious regime, no matter what religion it is. Uh, uh, maybe the one that practices Festivus, uh, Zora Festivus, that might be the, except, the only exception I'd make. Uh, but, uh, so, I'm no fan of the Iranian regime. Uh, I hope that one day there's a peaceful revolution that over, and you know, peaceful liberal re revolution that ushers in individual freedom and free markets, that would be great. But I don't want a war with Iran either. Um, the evidence, Again, in Porter's book and, and, and through other people, there, there's, a, uh, an, there's an Iranian expatriate who teaches chemical engineering at USC, Muhammad Sahimi. His stuff is uh, on, featured on uh, anywork.com, and uh, often he's a guest on Scott Horton's uh, show. Uh, he's no fan of the regime either. Uh, he, his own research uh, pretty much parallels uh, Gareth Porter's. So it seems to me the evidence is really very, very strong that Iran is not building a nuclear weapon and is not interested in building a nuclear weapon. But let's let's uh, relax that assumption and say maybe they are trying to. Maybe they or maybe they would like one if they're not trying to now. Um, there's another fact which I meant to mention when I met, when I mentioned that Iran was a signer of the NPT that I neglected to point out. I meant to say it then. Israel 
is not a signer, a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and it has many nuclear warheads that are ready to launch. Now, the numbers, the estimates uh, of how many warheads they have vary quite a bit. Uh, I've seen as high as 200. I've seen as low as 70. But we do know, and the U.S. government, I believe, now acknowledges that is Israel is the nuclear monopolist in the Middle East and has been. In fact, there's good evidence because there's been books uh, documenting this that Israel obtained its nuclear arsenal by smuggling stuff out of the United States with the cooperation of uh, not only Israel uh, sympathizers here, but even some members of the U.S. Uh, government. So it got things that, nor that wouldn't be legal to buy, uh, just you know, coming to the U.S. and trying to buy them. So uh, uh, we learned about nu the nuclear arsenal in the 80s when uh, one of their engineers or scientists, Mordechai uh, uh, Venunu, um, became a whistleblower and went to London and wrote a book and, and uh, talked about it in an interview with, uh, I forget who it was, Times of London. Uh, he ends up getting, uh, you know, covertly, uh, uh, gets arrested by, secret, by Israeli agents and spends time in jail, solitary confinement for many years. But nobody has refuted uh, Venunu. So it's the, you know, it's the largest open secret in the world. Israel that won't say it doesn't have them because it wants the, it wants the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, power you get from people knowing you have it, but at the same, you have the weapons, but at the same time, it won't say it doesn't have them. So it likes to play the strategic, what's called strategic ambiguity about it. But it is the nuclear monopolist. And as the, as the Iranians themselves have said, what would be the point of, get, of going to all this effort and expense, and it ain't cheap, to build a one nuclear warhead when Iran, Israel's right there with hundreds, and some of Israel's warheads are mounted on submarines, invulnerable submarines that are available for a second strike. That's why you have su nuclear submarines. The U.S. has them too. If the Russians ever took out our land uh, missiles, the, the subs are there to launch the second strike. Iran knows that. What would they gain? So it's it's totally credible that they don't want a nuclear weapon. They wouldn't gain anything by it. Uh, what could make them want one finally is all the threats from coming from Israel and from the United States, because the United States constantly says all options are on the table. Well, if you say all options, that includes the Americans' nuclear weapons, America's nuclear weapons. Saying all options, that's all. That's all options. So if anything would drive them toward it, it would be the kind of behavior that Netanyahu and a lot of Americans uh, are engaging in. So if, it seems to me if you don't want them to build a nuclear weapon, you would want to appeal to the, you know, the side of them that that's, does also doesn't want one. And instead, they're not in being encouraged. If anything, the hardliners here are in sort of a tacit alliance with the hardliners there. They have hardliners who don't want to deal with the U.S. So, you know, they're like McCain and Lindsey Graham and, uh, and Cruz and, uh, and all those guys and Boehner. Uh, they're in a tacit alliance. I doubt if they talk on the phone with each other about the, you know, how they can coordinate events. but but uh, they plus Netanyahu really constitute the hard line against those of us who want to, you know, lessen the tensions between these two countries and create some sort of detente and remove the threat of war. It's, um, that's how conspiracy theories are born, right? It seems <laughs> yeah, like. Yeah, I don't really think they're talking to each other. But hardliners everywhere agreeing, yeah. Um, dear me. That's... um. It's all so discouraging to talk about this, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's, um, uh, um, do you have, I guess I, I want to um, see if you have any optimism about, um, partially about the, the, the younger, this is very broad, but it's what's coming to my head, so I'm going to go with yeah. it. Um, you know, the, the vague idea that people of my generation are, since we're more tolerant, we like the gays and the, and the weed, so that's a start. Um, the war stuff, do you think that there's a way to get, or, 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 or I don't know, I, I'm not even optimistic enough to ask this question, <laughs> it's the horrible thing. Um, what, I don't know, like, it's more just back to what you see happening and what the hell any of us can do about the, this um the the war talk. I mean, do you advocate calling elected officials the way that some some of my fellow people at antiwar.com do? Like, what 
what do people do about that? Well, that's, that's a great question. Because it always feels like... Yeah. Uh, that's the, strate that's the question strategy question, which I've been you know pondering myself lately, but I don't have any great answers for that. I mean, uh, heck, you know, so call uh, a congressman or senator, so it, it won't cost you anything, so, you know, figure it can't hurt. It may not do much. Uh, write letters to the editor. Speak up when you can, even just in casual conversation if you hear someone talking about, hey, we need to go to war against Iran. Tell them what that would mean. Tell them about all the innocent people that would uh, be blown to smithereens in their uh, Tehran, which in many ways is a beautiful city. I haven't been there, but certainly seen enough pictures would be obliterated. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, even, it seems to me, even if you're a, a partisan of Israel, you would be concerned about war because Iran will you know, can't be counted on just to sit back and take it, right? It seems to me we'll want to retaliate. Uh, you know, when it, when Saddam Hussein of Iraq was our ally, uh, he launched an aggressive war against Iran, aided by the U.S. The U.S. provided satellite uh, intelligence and also the uh, components for what uh, for uh, chemical weapons. So, in a sense, uh, so in a real sense, it facilitated Iraq's uh, use of chemical warfare against the Iranians. Uh, that was a totally unprovoked uh, war, and uh, you know Iran hasn't attacked anybody in I think it's 250 years or something like that. So, uh, but we have you know we've built up Iran as the as the as the new uh, uh, bogeyman, and everything bad in the world was attributed to Iran or has been. ISIS now becomes sort of a rival, but uh, we're not quite sure whose side we're on, ISIS or Iran, because Iran doesn't like ISIS, and we're 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 fighting with Iran tacitly in Iraq, but we're fighting against Iran and in effect with Al Qaeda and ISIS in Syria. So we have a very mixed up uh, policy. It depends on you know what side of some arbitrary British line you're standing. British line from back in after World War One when they drew lines in the sand in the Middle East and created countries, uh, you know, out of all cloth. So I don't know how you convince people. I assume. You know, well, I don't. Want, I shouldn't assume. I haven't seen polls on this, but uh, maybe someone else has. I mean, are younger people uh, skeptical that Iran is really this uh, great evil that we have to go to war with before they come over? You know, invade us and take us over, and we'll all be speaking uh, Farsi and practicing Sh uh, Shiite Islam. Does anybody really believe that? Uh, I would hope younger people are mocking that, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it seems, it seems to me that um, there's a little bit of an aversion to trying to overthrow another whole government at, at, like Iraq. Um, but thankfully, we have ISIS to be the worst people in the world um, and to distract everybody and to be the sort of the, the undeniable, well, we just got to do something about these people. Um, you know, they, they came at a perfect time to be a distraction, it seems like. Except in Yemen, we're we're uh, supporting we're supporting uh, Arab Sunni nations like Saudi Arabia in Yemen, going after the Houthis, who are said to be backed by Iran. But I'm very, uh, I and a lot of other people are very skeptical of that. I mean, there might be some rhetorical support. They're kind of Shiites. They're an odd sect of Shiism, which actually has a lot in common with Sunnis, and the Houthis have been on good terms with the Sunnis in. Uh, in Yemen, and yet our so our effort, our backing in in Yemen is against the people that are supposedly backed by Iran. So we're in effect against Iran in Yemen. We're with Iran in Iraq, and we're against the Iran in in uh, Syria. So you figure it out. <laughs> it depends on where you're standing in the Middle East. That de that determines whose side. Oh, they don't. It's just. This is why they may not be conniving, you know, people sitting in their bunker plotting the downfall of the, of the world because they don't know what the fuck they're doing yeah. or what's happening either. That's the only thing they could be counted on, it seems like. No, I think that's a good point. They're not the wizards they want us to think they are. <laughs> Unless they want, I mean, every time I think about something like Iraq with like debathification and, and just like the general, particularly arrogant policies beyond the arrogance of actually invading a nation, but actually sort of, you know, trying to manage um, just 
And assuming there'll be no horrible backlash when you have, you know, 100,000 people uh, and the people who knew how to run the, ran the government have no work. And maybe that'll provoke some kind of collection of angry men. It's either, I mean, the mistakes, sometimes it feels to me that the mistakes that come out of these wars, particularly the recent ones back to Vietnam, yeah. e even and before, that they're so, they're so glaring that it, it, it has to be on purpose. Like there's they're some sort of, they're like agents of chaos that want to wreck whole countries and they I, not even control them, just wreck them. I don't know. It just seems like when I try to get into their mindset, I, I can't really get there because I don't know what they're trying right. to do exactly. I have the, I say the same thing all the time. I can't imagine what they're thinking. Uh, I try to figure out what they were thinking when they went into Iraq uh, back in 2003. And like I say, the only thing that makes sense in a way is that they thought they could then move on to Iran uh, and get a friendly, yeah. you know, get a new Shah. In there. I think the Shah's son still is living in the, uh, California probably ready to retake the peacock throne if uh, if the U.S. ever uh, engineers regime change there. But it is hard to uh, get in their heads and, and kind of see things the way they see it. Do they really think they can manage the Middle East? Do they really think they can reduce Iran to you know, like I say, some sort of minor uh, administrative district that would that the where the the U.S. or a puppet uh, of the U.S. Uh, you know, controls things and keeps keeps it from being influential. I mean, that's ridiculous. That, that's a conceit that that's you know just hard to believe that anybody could, could uh, uh, think that way. I mean, it, it, you have to be you have to blind yourself to history and to the just to the nature of Iran, the size of it, the history, its role throughout history. To act like it could be sort of some inconsequential minor state uh, is just ridiculous. I don't know who thinks that they're that omnipotent that, uh, or thinks the U.S. government so omnipotent that it could do that without having, you know, wars and casualties and other terrible things going on. But, of course, you know, they're not the ones that go fight the wars. So what do they care? And now in this era, you know, the, I think, you know, we're in this time now where they think <coughs> that they can get away with stuff in front of the American public because instead of sending hundreds of thousands of uh, troops, <coughs> they can do it, you know, mostly by they think they can mostly by air and uh, special ops, uh, you know, special forces that don't apparently don't count as boots on the ground, right? If it, uh, I guess uh, I don't think special ops wear boots. They must wear slippers or something because they, they never counted as boots on the ground. Uh, but you're not, if you don't have a big commitment of troops, I guess they feel, you do advisors. well, the U.S. public really won't care if it's not hundreds of thousands of, uh, of people. <coughs> I guess that's how they think. I can't imagine it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it, the terrible thing I always think is that, um, you know, you all, I almost want to say that drones, drones aren't as bad as the war in Iraq and special forces aren't as bad as sending all these boots on the ground. But it's never, I mean, I never know if there's a point to saying that at all. And we may rue the day when we, when we start getting terrorist drones coming our way, which is entirely possible yeah. that, that that will someday happen. That would be a lot easier than um, certain other overly detailed plots on their part. To me, it, all, it always comes down to I don't think that governments think that we, well, we're people and that particularly people abroad are people. And I think the average person, they may know in theory that Iranians are people and therefore there's this cultural difference that could be dramatic, mm -hmm. but that they're going to react in the same kind of way. And with, I mean, with terrorists, you know, terrorists are so educational because they will tell us why they do what yeah, they do. Bin Laden do. told us. He tried to tell us again and again. And but, it's a little religion or sort of cultural conservatism, but it's, it's, it's never that a lot. I mean, that's one out of, you know, 20 grievances listed. And... It's just eerie that the the way that people like the people who want to go to a war with Iran they don't listen ever because well, that would be condoning 9/11 or or the storming of the embassy or what have you. Well, and in Iran, you know, immediately the regime immediately uh, expressed sympathy after 9/11 and offered to cooperate, and there was the beginnings of cooperation. This, uh, I believe, is covered in Porter's book also. Uh, 
the Bush administration actually was allowing Iran to cooperate uh, until, you know, I don't know who he was taking advice from, they decided that was a bad thing. I mean, how do you maintain Iran as this, uh, like I say, this uh, evil if uh, you're working with Iran after 9-11? So they cut it off. And there have been, you know, they, they have rebuffed Iran several times uh, during, uh, during the Bush years. And this idea that, uh, oh, they finally got forced to the table thanks to the tough sanctions is just, as I said earlier, is just wrong. I mean, they say every, you know, they just try to pin everything on Iran. Again, I'm not a fan of the regime, but, you know, let's stick to facts. They've blamed lots of things on Iran that when other analysts and researchers have uh, checked it out, they found that it wasn't Iran that committed it. For example, and this is something Gareth Porter has worked on, too. Uh, what, I forget when it was, but some years ago there was an attack on a, a synagogue or a Jewish center in Buenos Aires. Immediately they blamed Iran. And Porter's research, talking to lots of people and probably has spent time down there, uh, says the evidence is actually that it was, uh, you know, some neo-Nazi group, not Iran. And uh, there have been incidents in the Middle East, like I think the blowing up the Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia, where uh, American, uh, American uh, troops were killed. In, in their barracks or something like that. Uh, uh, that was immediately blamed on Iran, Iran but I think uh, the evidence, and I haven't looked into this myself, but uh, but I think the evidence tends to show it was an Al-Qaeda group affiliate. But it's they just wanted to blame, they, Iran gets a blame for everything. I mean, how many times have you heard it said in the news that Iran, by some politician, that Iran is the chief sponsor of international terrorism, chief state sponsor? I never see anybody okay. make, make actually make the case. They say that. And I've read a lot of stuff, but I never see anybody say, here's the evidence. They just over the years have blamed everything on Iran as the first thing because they, you know, they just have this grudge against Iran because it overthrew our guy and then took hostages because they were mad at the CIA. Uh, and so ever since, any evil in the world is, is attributed to Iran. Um, you use the word grudge. And again, I mean, is it. How much of this is because of the embassy, and how much is, as you say, it's a big country, it's a powerful country in the Middle East, and there's a desire to, you know, have a puppet there or have, you know, yeah. bully them into doing what we want them to. Like, what, what do they want? I mean, say, say that they don't want, you know, an, a, a full-on war because that's going to be exhausting and kill lots of American troops. What, like? I don't know. I mean, is it just this grudge, which is a great word because it's so petty and so small, yeah. you know? Yeah, and I don't know how to assign the weights. I think it's all sort of combined. I think the larger geopolitical point you're making is, uh, yeah, is, is definitely valid. Uh, the U.S. doesn't want rivals in the in the Middle East. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is big and wealthy, but it uh, it needs the U.S. In, in, in certain ways, so it's it's you know it's not a non-aligned nation. It's it's in the U.S. camp. Doesn't mean it does everything we tell it to do. Uh, and then of course then there's Israel that wants uh, to be second to to uh, no one in terms of military power. Uh, and uh, I think that's not for uh, benign reasons. Uh, I know a lot of people will disagree with me on that, but I think uh, they I think Netanyahu and and the uh, their toughest hawks uh, want to uh, keep the occupied territories. And ideally, if they got their way, they would uh, find a way to get the Palestinians out of there. They want the land, but they don't want the Palestinians, which is one reason why it's different from apartheid. I'm reminded by a guy that writes about this stuff uh, that uh, in South Africa, under apartheid, you know, they didn't want the blacks to leave. They wanted the blacks to do the menial work. But in Israel, Certainly, the tough, the hardliners, the hardest of the hardliners in Israel, just about everybody's a hardliner. <laughs> the doves are a very small minority, but the hardest of the hardliners want the Palestinians out. They don't want them there doing the, you know, the the, the grunt work. They want them gone. So they want the land, whether it's for religious or uh, secular reasons. Uh, so it's uh, it's not strictly a South African style apartheid, although uh, day to day. It, it certainly looks like that because uh, Palestinians are treated uh, pretty badly. The ones, the ones who are citizens don't, aren't treated all that well, but the ones that are just the uh, occupants of the so-called uh, territories uh, are uh, are really, you know, have no rights whatsoever. They're totally under the arbitrary rule of the military in, uh, in 
the West Bank in Gaza is basically an open air prison. So it's a sad situation which is going on uh, 50 years, not too far away from 50 years. Um, yeah, the, we don't have enough time for me to pick your brain more about Israel, but I've always meant to kind of do that because that's a whole we can do other it. thing. We can, and that, we, can um, it, we can do next month, next month, so next, uh, what, a week, two, a week, two weeks from tonight, if you're going to be on that one. That would be free education for me, so that that would be good. Okay. I, I find that um, as many libertarians, as, as many... As often as I wish more libertarians were more anti-war, I actually think I've discovered last time Israel was the big news. How I was shocked how many libertarians are pro-Israel, even the ones you wouldn't expect who have sort of a defense for it. Yeah, I think some. And that was kind of a bummer. I think some of um, that is like Rand's reason for being pro-Israel. I mean, you know, Rand didn't say a lot about it, but she did say some things when she was asked to in a Q and A at one of her public speeches about it. I think around the time of the 73 war. And, you know, she made up her mind sort of a priori. She, her view was the, the Arabs are savages and the Israelis are, you know, Enlightenment, Western, sort of Western. The civil, they're the civilized. So, that, so they must be right and the Arabs must be wrong, period. That's all she needed to know. Uh, yeah. Well, the Arabs aren't savages. <laughs> uh, and the Israelis... We won't go. We don't need to go into here because tonight's Iran's night. We don't want to slight Iran, but uh, Israel has done lots of bad things, and, and, and I would take it back to the very founding. But we can't talk about that in a future session. Be happy to. Yeah, I'd like that. Um, I think it's about time to wrap up, unless you have any other words to share with the uh, the folks here. No, I, I have a few things to promote. As well. Uh, nothing coming up to promote. Just uh, keep watching the blog for my articles. TGIF is there every Friday. My T thank, uh, I was going to say thank goodness it's Friday, but the goal is freedom column. Uh, and then uh, once a week there's an, an op-ed length, about 700 word column on uh, oh something in the news. So check those things out. And otherwise, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, well, thanks a lot, Sheldon. Uh, let me just say that people should check out check out the Bitcoin Not Bombs. Oh, Liberty Me, thank you for handling that. But not, Bitcoin Not Bombs is doing a little contest um, dealing with Google mess with antiwar.com's um, ad. The many, click on that and go enter a contest and you can win a Bitcoin if you design a good uh, logo for Don't Expose Evil, which is a play on Google's um, Don't Be Evil motto. Um, and Liberty.me has just informed us that starting in a few minutes is Walter Block talking about child rights and abortion, so sort of classic, vaguely scandalous and interesting Walter Block stuff, but I might actually go check that out myself because it's going to be good. Um, I guess that's it. Um, go look at my Twitter. That's easy enough if you care. That's where you can see some of the stuff that I write. Um, I guess that's it. I, I'm, I forgot to introduce Sheldon at the beginning, so I'm paranoid I'm missing something vitally important, but I think we're just about done. Uh, right. Sheldon, thank you so much for this. My pleasure. Thanks again. Um, thanks, audience. And let's do this again sometime soon. Bye. Bye.